For years and centuries, we've considered the evolution of human intelligence. We have reached out to our closest living ancestor, hoping that by peering into their lives, we may better understand how evolution evolved. Researchers in the area of comparative cognition have developed strong programs in order to try to understand how animals perceive and intuit their worlds. One excellent example comes from Dr. Irene Pepperberg's lab. So let me start by introducing Alex. How many? How many? Two. That's right. You tell me what's different? Color. That's right. What color bigger? Shape. No, what color bigger? What color bigger? Green. Green is right. Good boy. So Alex knew over 100 words. He was able to identify objects using color, shape, and what material they were made out of. Not only could he do this with objects that he knew, but if you presented him with novel objects, he was able to identify those as well. He knew abstract concepts, such as greater than, uh, smaller than, same, and different. But we didn't always think of birds as being capable of this type of intelligence or this type of complex cognition. Indeed, in common vernacular, if you want to insult someone, they're stupid, they've done something crazy, you call them a bird brain, don't you? Well, this is beginning to change. We're starting to think about birds in a different way. Researchers that are interested in the evolution of intelligence, this evolution of complex cognition, believe that there's four important adaptations that set the stage for the evolution of complex cognition. The first one is that you have to have the right hardware. And looking at this picture that compares a human brain and a bird brain, it doesn't take a trained eye to see that they're significantly different from each other. Indeed, early research would agree with your conclusion. In this figure, we see again a bird brain paired up against a human brain. The green in this figure indicates the parts of the brain that are ready to process um, complex cognition. You can see that the human brain is encapsulated in green, whereas the avian brain only has a small couple of patches. Indeed, most of it is shaded in purple, and these purple areas are important for instinctual behavior, these stimulus response associations. But this is changing. New technology, and with the advance of researchers focusing on the comparative nature of birds and mammals, we see a completely different picture. The avian brain now has significantly more shading. We know that there's multiple areas that are important for the processing of comparative complex cognition. So we know that birds have the right hardware, but do they have this in the right amount? One way in which we can look at whether an organism is capable of engaging in intellectual thought or compare, uh, complex cognition is to measure its body-to-brain ratio. So as organisms get larger, by default, their brain has to get bigger to deal with all that additional real estate. If we have an animal that has a brain-to-body ratio, as we would expect, they'll fall along that green line. So two examples are the hummingbird and the ostrich. Organisms that have a bigger brain than what we would expect given their body size will fall above that line. And the perfect example is modern humans. But if you look really closely, you'll see that there's a bird that's above this line as well. And that's the crow, member of the corvid family. The second important adaptation for the evolution of complex cognition is living in large social groups. So being in a large social group affords you to learn about social knowledge. We know that birds form dominant hierarchies. An individual 
can learn from other individuals about who it should interact with if it wants to establish a friendly affiliation or who to avoid if it wants to get out of an aggressive encounter. Individuals can also learn from another individual by its mistakes and its successes without having to engage in that costly behavior itself. The third important adaptation is a long developmental period. During this period, the animal can learn about its environment and develop a repertoire of cognitive abilities. Finally, longevity. Animals have to be able to live for a long time to make use of this learning and the energy that's required to develop these cognitive uh, repertoires. Okay, so we know that birds have these four adaptations. We know that there are two families in particular, the parrots, as you saw at the very beginning with Alex, and the corvids, which are the jays, the crows that you saw, ravens, magpies, they all have these four adaptations. But where is the evidence that they're capable of complex cognitive behaviors? Well, I'm going to present you with three examples. There are many, many more that I hope will convince you at the end of the day that birds are capable of complex cognition. This is the Clark's Nutcracker. It's a North American bird. It's a food-storing bird that's a member of that corvid family. In the fall and in the summer, it goes around and it collects seeds. And it takes these seeds and it puts them in caches, thousands of caches over the mountainside. Then, when it's wintertime and food is scarce, it needs to remember where those thousands of caches are located in order to dig them up and have food to survive the winter. So here's an example of a nutcracker making a cache. It takes food from its sublingual pouch and it sticks it into the ground. It may stick two or three seeds into the ground, but we still consider that one cache. Now it's winter time, and the bird returns to that area, and it quickly and accurately locates that cache. We are able to take these birds into the laboratory in order to determine, well, maybe it's just a simple strategy. They always hide their seeds underneath trees. That's what I would do if I was a nutcracker, but they don't. We also can remove all food cues so they can't just sniff out those caches. Indeed, our conclusion over many years of research is that these birds are capable of this amazing spatial cognition. We can use this food caching behavior to look at our second example, and that's social cognition. Food caching is so important that these birds develop Cash, retreat, or cash protection strategies. Birds have been reported, when watched by another individual, to go back to that site, dig up their caches, and cache them somewhere else. Ravens will do false caches if they're being watched by another bird. They'll cache something like a stone or a twig, or they'll just go through the motions and they won't cache anything at all when they're being watched by another individual, but not if they're alone. So again, we can take this into the lab and we can look at it more carefully. One procedure we use is to put two cages side by side, one bird in each cage. One bird is given two trays filled with sand and a big bowl of pine nuts, and it can cache as many of these pine nuts as it wants while it's being observed by another bird. Once it's finished making its caches, we take those two trays, we put one on a cart outside of the, the cage, and nothing happens to this tray. It just sits there in safety. The other tray we give to the observing bird. And that observing bird is allowed to steal and eat as many of those caches as it wants, while the caching bird simply looks on. 
We then return those two trays back to the caching bird, and the bird is able to retrieve those caches. We carefully monitor its behavior, and what we see is that it treats those two trays significantly different from each other. Some species will go to that tray that's been pilfered, take as many seeds as it has remaining, and put them in that safe tray. Other birds, over time, will just stop caching in that compromised tray. Clark's nutcrackers, for instance, will just eat as much food as they possibly can that remains in that compromised tray, so that the other individual has no hope of getting its caches again. So we know that birds can use social cognition. They can learn from each other. They can maybe learn about in, in, uh, implications of other birds' behaviors. They can also learn about objects in their environment. Here's an example from Dr. Alan Camel's lab. What you'll see is a blue jay manufacturing and using a tool. So it takes strips. Of newspaper from the bottom of its cage, and uses it to secure a food pellet that's out of reach. Here's another example of Betty, the New Caledonian Crow, from a group of researchers in Oxford. Now Betty has a problem. There's food in a bucket at the bottom of this cylinder. Her beak is far too short to be able to reach it. She does have a, a long piece of wire, but it's straight, and that's not very helpful for securing this food. So what she does is very inventive. She takes the wire and she bends it, and it forms a functional hook. She can then use this hook to reach into the cylinder, grasp the handle of that bucket, pull it out, and access the tiny morsel of food. Well, if that wasn't enough to convince you, I have one more. Not only can birds manufacture tools and use tools, they can plan the order in which they need to use these tools. So, in this experiment, we see Betty again. We give her another problem. In this case, she has multiple tubes. There's food hidden at the far reach of one tube. Her beak isn't long enough again, but she has a short tool. But this short tool is only long enough to get a medium-sized tool. This medium-sized tool is long enough to get a longer tool. And then, once she has this longest tool, she can use it to secure the food at the end of the tube. So tonight, when you walk back to the parking lot, and you try to remember that one location where you've parked your car, and you talk to your social companion about where you hope to go foraging for dinner tonight, and you reach in your pocket and you take out that one tool that will allow you to open your car door, I want you to pause and think. What does it really mean to be a bird brain? Thank you. <laughs>